Let's turn to the book of Revelation, please. The main lesson of Revelation. Let me start by telling you what the main lesson of Revelation is. The main lesson is God is with His church. No matter how hopeless the situation looks, no wrong goes unpunished and no right goes unrewarded. Now that's what Revelation is really all about. I'm on a crusade to get the churches of Christ to put Revelation back in their Bible. Brethren, I think we've left it out too long. We've just kind of let the denominations have the book and, and they're twisting it and turning it all sorts of ways. We need to get back to good, sound teaching. And, and I'm as guilty as anybody. I actually once said from the pulpit, I'm glad Revelation is at the back of the book because that's the last book I'm ever going to study. I'm so ashamed of having said that, but I honestly said that from the pulpit one time. Since I have delved into and, and focused on learning the book of Revelation, it has revolutionized my ministry. I believe I'm far more effective as a minister because I have added that in too. And, and I don't know of a book that, is more, that gives you more confidence and hope than the book of Revelation. Now, I know the whole Bible does that. You know, I'm, I can just hear you say, well, Curtis, the whole Bible does that. Yes, it does, but not in the way that Revelation does. We need this book in the 21st century. Revelation, <clears throat> apocalypsis, is the first Greek word where we get apocalyptic language from. It's a word that means disclosure or appearing or a coming enlightenment or a manifestation, a, a message that is, is being exposed and, and brought into light, a revelation. Apocalyptic language is a picture language. And it is revelation and not revelations. There is no S on the end. And so if your neighbor says revelations, go ahead and, and punch him or something, because that is incorrect. And it's more than semantics, folks, because it is not multiple revelations. It is one continual revelation. That's what it's designed to be. And this revelation is in apocalyptic language. So you'll have a scene, and, and something happens, and you watch the scene, and you say, okay, there is no way that could be literal. So what does it mean? The book of Revelation is not literal. Now listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you, because you're going to walk out here and say, well, he doesn't believe the Bible is the word of God. The Bible is the perfect, unadulterated word of God. But we don't use the word literal correctly. We go to the Mexican restaurant and we say, I ate that food and my tongue was literally on fire. I'll bet it wasn't. Not literally. We read passages in Revelation that says something like, they took their robes and dipped them in the lamb's blood and they came out white as snow. Really? That's literal? That's not literal, folks. That's apocalyptic language. And, and you don't take it literally, you take it for what it says. And it says what Jesus wants it to say. It's frustrating to us in the 21st century because we have to go to the trouble to learn what the numbers mean and the colors and the symbols. And you cannot approach Revelation like you do Mark or James or Jonah where you just read it and, and you can understand it. You have to put a little effort into it. But I'm telling you, brethren, it is well worth the effort. The first century Christians did not have to put any effort into it. They already knew apocalyptic language. Ezekiel, Daniel, so many books used Apocalypse. They, they were familiar with it. We just have to learn it so we can understand it. So you need an understanding of apocalyptic language. You need a basic understanding of the Old Testament too because there's a lot of references to the Old Testament. <clears throat> if you look at Revelation chapter 1, we see that John the Apostle is on the island of Patmos when he receives this revelation. And it starts off in verse 1, the revelation 
of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his bondservants, the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his servant John, <clears throat> who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. <clears throat> Blessed is he who reads, and those who hear the words of the prophecy, and heed the things which are written in them, for the time is near. One of the biggest misconceptions about the book of Revelation is that it is about something way, way off in the future for the first century audience. And yet twice in the first three verses, he says, no, that's not true. He says in verse 1 that these are things which must soon take place. In taxe is the Greek word. It's actually the word where we get our word taxi. When you call for a taxi, and we don't have taxi service in Shakota, by the way, but if you're in a city and you, you call for a taxi, when do you want it? Anytime in the next 2,000 years? Is that what you mean? No. Now. And, and that's what the word means. When, when Paul told Timothy to come to him soon, he uses intoxe. He needed the parchment so he could read those again, and he needed his coat. Those Roman winters were getting cold. When do you think that he meant for Tim, Timothy to come? Anytime in the next 2,000 years? We want it soon. Jesus says these things will soon take place. That's what he tells the first century Christians. And then he says at the end of verse 3, the time is near. Now that is a word <clears throat> that means by your elbow. It's right here. It's close. So twice in the first three verses, he explains this is when it's going to happen. It's going to happen soon. The time is near. And throughout the book, let's just kind of do a peruse here of a few verses. Look at chapter 2, verse 16 where Jesus says, speaking to the church in Pergamum, therefore repent, or else I'm coming to you quickly, and I'll make war against them with the sword of my mouth. And look at chapter 3 and verse 11. I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have so that no one will take your crown. And then look at 22. Look at the end of the book. Chapter 22 and verse 7. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. And then he says also in verse 12, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. And then verse 20 says, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Now, what impression do you get from the words of Jesus as to how soon he's going to be there? He says, I'm coming quickly, not way off in the future. One of the most popular views of the book of Revelation is the futurist view. This is the view that movies and books like Left Behind, if you've seen some of those, that's what that's based on. You know, and, and that stuff, it makes great Hollywood stunts. They're, they're never going to make a movie based on my book, by the way. That's, that's not going to happen. Uh, but but uh, they, they do some stuff where they just, uh, they say, oh, well, this is about uh, uh, Apache. Oh, thank you, really. That's not the wine of the wrath of God. Okay, all right. I'll be careful with that. Mm. So it's not about Apache helicopters and, and bazookas and M1 tanks and 200 million screaming Chinese soldiers. I mean, it's unbelievable the things that people plug into the book of Revelation say this is what it's about. But it's not about that. Any interpretation you hear about Revelation that has an application that made no sense to the first century audience, that is a false teaching. How does that, is that simple enough? You understand that? Look at verse 6. Still in uh, chapter 22. And he said to me, 
These words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his bondservants the things which must, look at this, soon take place. How many of you think that's the Greek word intoxe? You may be right. That's exactly what it is. Again, he's saying these things will soon take place. Look at verse 10. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. Did you know that Daniel, the book of Daniel, was a sealed book? After Daniel was given that promise, he said, seal this up. It's not for this time. That's in Daniel chapter 12 and in verse 4. But this, he said, do not seal up the book, the prophecy of the book. Why? For the time is near. Could he be any plainer about that? So all these futurist views that you hear, when you hear that stuff on uh, the radio preacher or you read it in a book or you see it in a movie, that's false. And I grew up in a denominational church. We used to watch rapture films. I remember as a little boy being scared to death. Guys, it looks like the moon's going to turn red blood, blood red tonight. And I, I don't know, boy, this is scary stuff. That is, it's all false. If it didn't make sense to first century Christians, it is an inaccurate interpretation of what the book says. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't apply to us. It very much applies to us. But we have to understand that it's a historical setting and then apply it as, as we see what the book means. All right. Let's get into a little bit of the book here. Uh, John is told to send his revelation to the seven churches of Asia Minor, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. If you look those up on a map, they go clockwise, starting there on the coast with Ephesus and up and around in Asia Minor. And you can just kind of see how they were circulated. These letters were passed on. And, and he has individual sermons on each of the, uh, or messages for each of the seven churches, which I'm going to skip, chapters 2 and 3. Marty can preach on that if he wants, all right? But uh, in chapter 4, let's go there. Revelation chapter 4, because this is the throne scene. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting on it was like jasper stone and, and sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. And around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments, and golden crowns were on their heads. Can you imagine being invited up into heaven? I wish that somehow I could, I could peel back the ceiling here and all of us could just get a little glimpse of heaven. Don't you know that, like, just for 10 seconds, if you could see what heaven was like, wouldn't that change your life forever, just to see that? John was so blessed. He got to go up and to be in the throne room of God, and he can't even think of words to describe he who sits on the throne. How would you describe it? How would you describe God having seen him on the throne? And he just does the best he can. And around this throne is 24 elders, and one of the numbers that's important in Revelation is the number 12. It means a representation of God's people on earth. 12 patriarchs, uh, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles. Anytime you see the number 12, it means God's people on earth. And so these 24 elders are constantly these reminders of God's people on earth, constantly around the throne of God, constantly in his presence. It means God is very much aware of his people. He's holding in his hand a scroll. A scroll, and John knows that's the reason he's here, is for this scroll. 
And somebody needs to be worthy to open the scroll. When you had a message from a king, not just anybody could open the scroll. To break the seal, you had to be worthy. And so they announced, who is worthy to open the scroll and look inside? And nobody was found in heaven or on earth. And so you know what John did? He cried like a baby. Because he knew that was the reason that he was there was because he was supposed to open that scroll. He was supposed to get that message. And so he, he bawled, but he was comforted by one of the elders. says, don't worry, the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he's worthy. He can open the scroll. And so he turns to see the lion. He, he's going to go see the lion. But when he turns, he doesn't see a lion. He sees a lamb. And not just any lamb, a lamb looking as if it had been slain. Now, that's a big difference between a lion and a lamb. Lions are powerful creatures. King of the forest, right? Uh, lions are fast. They're big. They're powerful. Lamb, mm, not so much. Lambs are pretty defenseless. And so I'm all confused. Which one is Jesus? Is he the lion or is he the lamb? Oh, he's both. You see, my Lord, he knows when to be a lion and he knows when to be a lamb. And men, listen to me. We need to learn how to be like Jesus. Because there's times you and I, we need to be lions. We need to stand up and we need to be fierce and strong for our families. And there's times we need to be lambs and meek and teachable and approachable by our children. My Lord knew how to do both. But the lamb is worthy. He can take the scroll and he can open the seals, chapter 5, verse 1. I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back and sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who's worthy to open the scroll and to break the seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. But Jesus Christ was able. He opens the scroll. Let's go to chapter 6. He starts breaking the seals of this scroll. And he breaks the first seal, and there goes a horseman. It's a white horseman, okay? And he just kind of rides across. And then he breaks another seal, and here comes a red horse. And he goes across. And he breaks the third seal, and here goes a black horse. And then he breaks the fourth seal, and there goes a, a, a pale horse. And we're watching this thing. What in the world is going on? Well, I told you it's picture language. You sit back, and you watch the picture... But then you start plugging in the principles of apocalyptic literature, and it will make sense. Four is the number for the world. So the number is important, the four. Uh, the first horseman is white. White represents purity. It's used 16 times in the book of Revelation. Every single time, it means purity. The first horseman is Jesus Christ. The second horseman is red, and he is given the power to take peace from the earth. And if you take peace from the earth, what's left? War. This horseman is war. And then the third horseman is black, and black is the color of evil. And so this horse represents the evil that was going on, the, the persecution of the first century church, the seven churches of Asia Minor. And he, he actually represents economic discrimination because the Christians were being discriminated against. If they didn't belong to the trade guild, they were persecuted, and they, uh, they didn't have opportunities to make enough money really to feed their families. And that was wrong. That was evil. And so that's what that horse represents. And the fourth one, the pale horse, is death. We're even told in the text what that is. So we're watching these scenes unfold. And Jesus is breaking these seals, and this is what's happening. But he breaks the fifth seal, and let's read that in, in chapter 6, verse 9. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the Word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true Will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe. And they were told they should rest for a little while longer until the number 
of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. So we have this picture. We're still in the throne room. And there's the altar. You know, the altar of the Old Testament. I don't know if you've ever seen a, a picture of what that altar might have looked like, but it had horns on the corners, and they would, they would uh, cook, uh, incinerate, really, the bird offering on top, and the ashes would fall through, and it would be underneath the altar. Well, here's the souls of those who have been slain. Notice their souls had not been slain. Their bodies were slain. Their souls would go on forever. And they're crying out, Lord, how long? How long is it going to be until you avenge our blood? And God says, in about 2,000 years, we're going to take care of those guys. Would, would that encourage you? No, that's not what he said. He said, you need to wait a little while longer. We still got a little bit more to do. And really what we find out, if you read Revelation carefully, what God is waiting on is for more people to repent. He's going to send these seals. He's going to send trumpets to warn them, hoping that people will repent. And when he, he's warned enough, then he's going to send the judgment on the Roman Empire, those who are oppressing the Christians. In chapter 7... He's, he's breaking these seals, and he's already brick, uh, broke five of them. He breaks the sixth one in, in verse 12 of chapter 6. We won't read that. Uh, get the book. Uh, chapter 7, verse 1. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth, or on the sea, or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from... And the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bond servants of our God on their foreheads. Four is the number for what? The world. Very good. All right. You're listening. So... We have four angels, and they're holding back the four winds. Now, winds, in apocalyptic language, stands for judgment. And so he's breaking the seals, and we're going to have this judgment. But before it happens, it's like, time out, wait a minute, don't break any more seals. We've got to hold back the judgments. And you kind of picture these angels, and they're holding back the judgments. What are we waiting on? Well, we're waiting on God's children to be sealed. Now, the seal, according to Ephesians, is the promised Holy Spirit. And when do we receive the Holy Spirit? A baptism. And so he is giving the opportunity, or maybe those who are on the fence, maybe those who know they should get baptized, but they're kind of putting it off. He's holding back the four winds, waiting. You want to get baptized now? This would be a good time. Go ahead. And that's what's happening here. He's, he's pausing until everybody who wants to be saved will be saved before he unleashes this judgment. The number who are saved, if you look at verse 4, it says, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 were sealed <clears throat> from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And then he lists the 12 tribes of Israel and says they're sealed. The 144,000 there is a religious group that says this is a literal number, a literal 144,000. You can't do that with the book of Revelation. It's either literal or it's not literal. It's either literal or it's apocalyptic. This is an apocalyptic number. What did I tell you 12 is the number for? God's people on earth. We've got some good listeners in this group. I appreciate that. God's people on earth. 12 times 12. It's 144. So we're going to take God's people on earth times God's people on earth. In other words, everybody. And then we're going to even go one step further. We're going to multiply it times 1,000. 1,000 is not a literal number in the book of Revelation. It means to the extreme, to the nth degree. So we have God's people times God's people times 1,000. In other words, nobody is going to be left out. 
Nobody is going to be receive the blunt end of God's judgment by accident. That doesn't happen in God's judgment. He's counting everybody. And these are people on earth, by the way. Verse 9 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one can count from every tribe and all the peoples and tongues, and standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. Uh, the palm branches we know from, from uh, Matthew, or excuse me, from John chapter 12, that uh, they were spreading out the palm branches before Jesus. That's a symbol of peace. But these multitude, where are they at? They're in heaven. That's what he's saying. It says they're before the throne. And so the 144,000 are the ones that are there on the earth, God's people on earth, and the multitudes are in heaven. Did you know there's this same religious group that I'm talking about says 144,000 are going to heaven and the rest, the multitudes are going to remain on earth? They got it backwards, didn't they? That's not what it says. If we just look, just read, it's amazing what we'll see here. Everybody who needs to be saved is going to be saved. And heaven is not going to be lonely, by the way. It says there are going to be multitudes of people there, multitudes of good people who love the Lord and love worshiping the Lord and honoring Him. And that's what's going to be wonderful about heaven. The, the seventh seal is not broken until chapter 8. And so let's get there. Chapter 8, verse 1. And the Lamb broke the seventh seal. And there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. I heard a preacher talking about this verse one time, and he said, this is how we know there's not going to be any women in heaven because no woman can be silent for a half an hour. <laughs> Ladies, I would never use such a horrible joke as that. That is just, that is so ridiculous. I know a woman can be silent for a half an hour. She has to work at it pretty hard, but she could do it. <laughs> Gosh. I know some brothers that can't be silent for a half an hour either. So, No. It's not a literal period of time. This is the book of Revelation. Anytime you see fractions in the book of Revelation, it means partial. Half, third, fourth, doesn't matter what it is. It just means partial, not complete. And so we have a, a partial uh, pause, a silence, before the partial judgment is about to start, which is the trumpets. That's what's about to come. And so we, we see the silence in Zephaniah 1 and verse 7, Zechariah 2 verse 13, Habakkuk 2 verse 20. Anytime God's about to send a judgment on the world, there's a period of silence to mark the coming of this judgment. Verse 2. How much longer do I have, by the way, brother? Okay. How much longer, though? At 7.50? Oh, gosh, okay. All right. I'm only to chapter 8, you know. I'm, I'm getting a little nervous here. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll speak in stereo, brother, so we can hear it. Okay. So, verse 2. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came, and he stood at the altar, holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him, so that he might add it to the prayers of the saints on the golden altar, which is before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hands. We have here a picture of, of these prayers and they're ascending before the presence of God. Sometimes we think, you know, is God hearing our prayers? Read Revelation. Yes, God is constantly hearing the prayers of the saints and they're going up before God. Verse 5, and then the angel took the censer and he filled it with the fire of the altar and he threw it to the earth, and there followed peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. Is it literal? No, this is the book of Revelation. None of it is literal. But there's an important message here. The peals of thunder and the lightning, is that's just all signs of the presence of God. Remember back to Mount Sinai in the Old Testament. That showed the presence of God and His awesomeness. And so he's initiating this, this judgment. I don't know where to go from here, but we're going to jump to... Let's go to chapter 20, all right? I have lots more notes, but I'm going to skip it all because I want to get to something important here in chapter 20. Chapter 20 and verse 1.
Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and the great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. And after these things, he must be released for a short time. In between chapter 8 and chapter 20 that I just skipped over, promise me you're going to read that because you're going to see angels everywhere. Thousands and thousands, myriads and myriads of angels at God's beck and call. And he's sending this judgment on the Roman Empire, but who is behind Rome? It's Satan. That's always our enemy, people. Our, our battle's not with flesh and blood. Isn't that what Ephesians says? Our battle's not with flesh. Satan is the enemy. But when it comes time to capturing the enemy, how many angels does it take? One. One goes down there with a chain and a key, grabs him by the beard. I, I, you just picture this. Wraps him up with a chain and throws him in the abyss and locks it up. I love that scene. Because who's in charge? Sometimes we think just oh, things are just so big, I just can't handle it all. And that's how our first century brethren felt about Rome. It's just, there's no way we can defeat this. They want us to bow before the god Roma. That's the god of Rome. Or, or before uh, Caesar's god and say, Caesar's our Lord. But we're not going to bow because Jesus is our Lord. But how do we defeat this? Our god is so much more powerful than Satan. He binds him for a thousand years. Is it literal? Say no. No, it's not literal. Thousand is a degree to which he is bound. It's like if we tied up Marty and I said, you're not getting out of there in a thousand years. Okay? It's not how long, that's the degree to which he's bound. So he bounds up Satan, but then he says he turns him loose. Well, why would you turn him loose again? So you can catch him again. It's fun. Okay? <laughs> I mean... He's portraying Satan like he's a little mouse. And, and that's how we need to see him compared to God. Now, compared to us, if we had to take on Satan by ourselves, whoo, oh, we wouldn't have a chance, would we? But when we see how small Satan is compared to our almighty God, it's awesome. I think I just have a few minutes. Let's go to chapter 22. I'm going to tell you, uh, chapter 21 and 22, you have two options here. It's either talking about heaven or it's talking about the church. I used to believe it was talking about heaven. I no longer hold that position. You can read my book and I'll explain why. But basically, let me tell you, I don't believe it's talking about heaven because it is the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And because, uh, look back at chapter 21. Look at verse 12. It's describing this new Jerusalem. Verse 12 says it had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and on the names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east and three on the north and three gates on the south and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Did you notice a 12 in there anywhere? What does the number 12 stand for, class? God's people on earth. I believe chapter 21 and 22 is describing the church. It's huge. It's 18,000 miles long, and it's as wide and high as it is long. That's roughly the size of the United States, folks, plus 18,000 miles high. I mean, it's, it's huge. 18,000, 1,800, I'm sorry. It's not that huge. But anyways, it's big enough that anybody can come in. We got room for everybody, don't we? Anybody can come into the kingdom. It, it, it's, it's huge. It, it's powerful. It's safe. Uh, the walls are 72 yards thick. It's very safe. You know what? Church ought to be the safest place we go all week long. This is where we're safe, folks. And it's beautiful. 
It's beautiful. It's made out of gold. It's polished like glass. It's got jasper. It's, it's described as a very beautiful place. This is our Lord's church. At the gates where you enter into the kingdom, and we enter into the kingdom at baptism, there are 12 angels. You know what? I believe there's an angel present when somebody is baptized into Christ. God is aware of what's going on. I have so much more to tell you about Revelation, but I'm out of time. I wish I had a little more time, but you've been a good audience and you've listened carefully. I hope I've at least encouraged you to take a look at this wonderful book. It will bless your life if you will just take the time to peer into its pages. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your word, all of it. All your word is a blessing, but especially this book, Revelation. We're warned at the end of this book not to add to it, not to take away, unless we want added to us the plagues that are described in this book. God, I pray that we will heed that warning, that we'll not change your word one iota. We don't need to change it, God. We don't need to change the church. You design the church. You know how it's supposed to work. All we need to do is follow your blueprint. And so, God, help us to do that with all of our hearts. God, I thank you for this congregation here at Choctaw. I pray that you bless these people. Help them to grow strong in their faith. Help them to reach out in this community that on that great day when we all stand before your throne and the books are open, I pray that each one of us will be able to stand before God with a clear conscience, knowing that though we're not perfect, we're saved by the blood of your Son, and we are so blessed to be part of your kingdom. God, thank you so much for Jesus Christ and what he means the sacrificed lamb that died for our sins. And it's through him that we pray.